Bring me everyone. What do you mean everyone? EVERYONE! Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. Today we're going to have the opportunity to talk about the hopes and dreams of a young and naive mechanical engineer. Now, I realize that sounds kind of boring, and typically <laughs> that really would be, except for that mechanical engineer happens to be someone who turned into one of the most legendary knife makers in history, and that is Mr. Todd Rexford. And what we're looking at right here also symbolizes the most expensive knife that I have ever featured on my channel in the 12 years that I've been doing this here on YouTube. And it really is special. It is something that we're never going to see again. This is a one-off knife. So if you're wondering, was it, is it really worth $28,000? Well, it is to the person who paid for it. And luckily, that person happens to be a friend of mine. And his train of thought was, let me buy this incredibly expensive, super rare knife and uh, immediately have the retailer send it over to my buddy Jim so he can play with it for a while and share it with his audience. And it's a good thing because it's going into a private collection, so it's unlikely that we're ever going to see this knife again. So this is the only chance that you or I will have a chance to see this knife. Thought process continues with, okay, well, whenever Jim's done, then I'll take possession of my new baby. And unfortunately, this has taken a lot longer than either of us probably anticipated. And I've had this in my house now for about three weeks. And while I have enjoyed every second of it, when I get a chance to touch, fondle, and flip it, I'm sure he's got to be chomping at the bit waiting to get his hands on his new knife. So to my friend, who likes to remain anonymous when we do things like this, thank you so much. It is absolutely incredible. You're going to love it, and it's been a great honor having the chance to play with it. It also gave me the honor of being able to open up some communication with Todd Rexford because uh, he and I do not travel in the same circles. He has no clue who I am. I'm not even a blip on his radar. Yet when I reached out to him with a few questions about this knife, which we'll get into, he was incredibly generous with his time, super friendly, uh, and pretty damn funny as well. So it was really cool having that opportunity to get a chance to, to speak with him a little bit and figure out where his mind was at when he came up with this incredible knife with a ridiculous name that is a little bit hard to memorize. So I'm going to tell you right now, I'm probably going to call it the NMB1 more than once in this video instead of NM1B. That is the actual name. Because I have no correlation for that odd mixture of letters and numbers like he did, and we'll discuss all that in just a few minutes. So I, it's probably going to roll off my tongue the wrong way, so forgive me if that happens. And right now, I think it's time to get over to the tabletop and get a nice close-up look at what $28,000 could buy you if you find yourself in the lucky financial situation where you can afford to buy one. Oh, shit. Here we go again.
just soak it in for a few more seconds, look at it close up, and reel in the beauty that we're about to experience together. If you're wondering if I'm excited, uh, yeah, man, if you could only feel these nipples, you'd wonder, Jim, why are you making me feel your nipples? This is very awkward and uncomfortable. But let's be awkward and uncomfortable together. The Rexford NM1B isn't just a knife, it's a testament to the skill and passion of its maker. If you want to see a piece of knife making history, keep watching because we're going to be playing with it together. Look at how gorgeous this is. Even if you weren't a fan of the patterns and the things that he's done in this, you would have to look at the knife as a whole and just go, wow, I can't believe that somebody was able to put all of this together in one knife. Now, Todd Rexford isn't just a knife maker. He's a visionary craftsman whose journey began with a passion for precision engineering and design. As I mentioned in the intro, he was a mechanical engineer. And he has graduated from that to being one of the premier living knife makers. And when you say his name in the right circles, which would be in any circle of knife collecting, people instantly know who he is. They can instantly conjure up an image of one of his famous knife designs in their mind and go, wow, yeah, boy, I'd love to own one of those. And even if it's just one of his designs that inspired a production knife, that's still met with awe because every design that has gone into production, whether it was a zero tolerance or it was a Boker or whatever brand it was, each of them were special. And I remember a buying frenzy for the ZT. when the, I think they had called it the Copperhead at the time. It was a design that he already had out there in production and this kind of copper color came out. Uh, not too dissimilar from the color of the watch I'm wearing. And people went absolutely apeshit at the time when that came out. And while I'm not really a Kershaw or a ZT fan, it was one of the best knives that they ever made. It was really, really cool. And if I can find a picture from one of my archives, I'll pop it up here on the screen. Otherwise, I'll try to remember to link to the review that I did many, many years ago when I bought three of them myself. But that's a far cry from what this is. Todd honestly brings a unique perspective into the art of knife making. And it really is an art because what he does is... Uh, he has been known to create art knives as well as tactical knives and then blend the two together. Make no mistake, this is an art knife. It may be a tactical knife style. It may be perfectly suitable for EDC, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes. But this is, in every way, a true art knife. It may not have, you know... 24 karat gold filigree. It may not have crazy scroll work engraved through it. It may not have inlays of mother of pearl or zirconium. And it certainly doesn't have any rubies or diamonds inlaid into the backspacer. But it is most certainly an art knife. And you may be looking at this going, okay, so it's got some cool brushed titanium panel set into this dark bead blasted titanium frame and that looks pretty cool and all oh and then uh, he engraved some lines into it and it dyes them blue yeah there's so much more to this knife than just that and I can't wait to share that with you it is absolutely exceptional he's constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible in knife design and this honestly is a testament to that now is this knife or any knife worth $28,000 to you? What? No. Well, when you buy a Todd Rexford knife, you're not just buying a tool. You're investing in the legacy of a true craftsman. And the NM1B is a shining example of Todd's dedication to his craft. This is very much signature Todd Rexford looks and complication that doesn't look 
as complex as it actually is. Because as I mentioned, it looks like there's just a, a couple of cool inlays of titanium that have been somehow engraved and then anodized blue. But there's more to it than that. Now, this is the second NM1B that I've had the opportunity to handle and spend a good amount of time with between days and weeks with each one. And I have to say that while they're definitely works of art, they feel so solid and so substantial that this is a knife that you'd feel perfectly okay with carrying as an EDC and actually using. Now, I realize all of that is subjective. Everybody's going to see things differently when you're spending as much money as you'd pay for a new Honda. And I know my friend that paid for this knife will absolutely, 100% definitely be carrying it. He's done so with many exotic and rare customs, and pretty much all of his knives show signs of wear or have a scar here and there on them. And this is honestly going to be no exception. I, I, I can guarantee that the day he gets this package, he's going to cut it open with a knife that's worth almost as much, and he's going to put this directly in his pocket and carry it for the rest of the day. There's just no way around it. That's just the way he is. Now, this is a special event for me for a lot of reasons, but mainly because I've stated for over a decade here on my channel that a Rexford is my personal ultimate grail. And in specific, for me, it would be a singularity. That would be the model that I would want. Now, I certainly wouldn't turn down the opportunity to buy one of these, absolutely. But for some reason, the singularity always sung to me. Uh, and in the beginning, it was the epicenter. That was the first knife I went, oh, I've got to have one of his knives. But since I am more of a flipper guy, I would rather have a singularity flipper. There's just something about it. And his actions, by the way, are truly remarkable. Think of the greatest flipper that you have ever touched. And I promise you, this is significantly better. Number one, it is as glass smooth as you would expect it to be, and I'm demonstrating that by letting it drop closed. Obviously, you're not going to close it like that. You're going to close it like a normal human being. But the other big thing is not just the incredible smoothness, but it's the way that he tunes his detents. It is very, very crisp, making for a lightning-fast opening, but it's not an overbearing detent. It doesn't feel laborious to get this thing open and you're like Ugh, struggling and pushing against it. It's just you have this, this wall right here that you're sitting on and a perfect break. And if it sounds like I'm talking about a gun, I almost kind of am. The action on this is like a high-end five, six, eight thousand dollar custom 1911 or 2011 as compared to other knives that we flip and go, that's really, really nice, being like a really good custom Glock trigger. While that's good, it will never hold a candle to that crisp, straight pullback, two and a half pound, crisp wall break 1911 trigger. And that really is going to be the difference here. When you feel one of these and you flip it, whether it's one of his thumb stud openers or a flipper, you can't help but stop and go, wow, that is exceptional. And you don't feel very many knives that have an action like that or have a detent like that. Again, that's going to be in this upper echelon of knife makers. And I've mentioned this only a few times before, uh, and one certainly would have been on one of the many full custom handmade Todd Bag knives that I've had a chance to uh, review he has the same magic with his detents. These are guys that are at the absolute pinnacle of the knife making game. And that's why they charge what they charge. And that's why retailers upcharge what they charge. And that's why the secondary market absolutely rakes you across the coals like they do. Because these knives are the epitome of perfection. Now, I asked Todd about the NM1B because I wondered if that 
meant something, if it was short for something or, or, you know, was it something cool or funny like Nightmare One Build or No More Single Bitches or anything? And uh, no, unfortunately, it's uh, basically a file name. As he was developing this design and he was saving the files for e after every little change that he made, it was just the file structure naming system that he was using as he prototyped it. NM1 is the file name and B was the size variant. It's as simple as that. And that was what was helping him keep track of his drawings as he was working on them. And it took him so long to develop this knife that he was on the NM1 file for so long that the name just kind of stuck to the design and he rolled with that because in his head, after God knows how long it took him to finalize the design, that was what the knife was. That was the name that was associated with it in his mind for all of that time. So that's where it went. So I thought that was pretty interesting. It is frustrating that it doesn't have some kind of cool special meaning like, I don't know, it's the first initial of his uh, three children's names or something like that. And we see knife makers choose model names for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's something as simple as what Todd's reasoning was, or it could be something that's uh, very, very heartfelt and close to the maker in their personal life, or it could just be a cool sounding name. Like me, I tend to go with cool sounding names and a lot of the stuff, you know, the things that I'm interested in, like horror movies and sci-fi movies and stuff like that. So, you know, you get Hellraiser and Hellfire and, and stuff like that out of me. I just don't have that cool of a backstory. It's, it's pretty simple when you boil it down. Recognizing all of the precision that went into making this knife is exactly why I roll my eyes when people talk about how high-end custom makers and their pricing and, you know, and they say, You're just paying for the name. As if that's a bad thing. Of course you are, dumbass. You're paying for that level of skill honed over years and years of trial and error, pain and suffering, and wild experimentation. And it's not somehow uncool or stupid to pay a premium for exceptional skill. What kind of special idiot are you? You're going to do that in every walk of life, whether it's a car, a knife, whatever it is. You're going to pay more for that higher quality, for the heritage that that name represents. That's just the way it is. So are you paying a little more for this because it has the name Rexford on it than if it had, uh, I don't know, uh, Johnny Two Tits? I don't know. Yeah, you are. Because you're paying for the legacy of his work. You're paying for the entire body of his work. Because you don't even have to have this knife in your hand. If you're having a conversation with a friend or an acquaintance that also knows a lot about knives, and you say, yeah, I've got a Todd Rexford knife, they instantly know that you own one of the finest knives ever made. They don't have to see it. They don't have to know what materials it's made out of to know that it is made with the most extreme precision and the finest finishing work that money can possibly buy. And that is done because of his reputation. So it's very, very effective. So of course, yes, you are in part paying for the name on the blade. No way around it. I just don't get why some people associate that with a bad thing somehow. This also leads me into another one of my pet peeves, the overuse of the term grail knife. What I'm holding here is a grail defined by there is one of these and it's highly unlikely you'll ever be able to own it and its value is so high that you'll likely never be able to afford it if the owner were to in fact ever sell it. So it's beyond reach for two reasons. 
And that really is where it all comes down. Being named after the Holy Grail, which is an artifact that has now been searched for for just over a thousand years. It can't be found, apparently. And no amount of money is going to help anybody find it either, because it certainly has up until this point. It is unobtainable, just like this. That $300 production knife that you fell in love with and want so badly but can't spare the extra money on it this pay period is not a grail. It's an aspirational goal. It's a goal knife. It's something that you're going to work towards. You'll save up money and you'll buy it when you see it again because it's not the one single only one out there and you'll own it. Because the day that you have the money to spend on it, you're going to be able to find it, being a production knife that is everywhere, that they made thousands of. A goal that has even a remote possibility of being achieved is absolutely not a grail. Stop it. Stop it. Get some help. Now, I suppose after all this blathering on about how amazing the knife is, you probably want to know a few specs on it so that you can buy one for yourself. I'm sure that's exactly where everybody's head is at right now. Man, I would buy this right now if Jim would just tell me the specs on it. I want to know the size. Maybe it's not going to fit in with my lifestyle. Overall length is about eight and three quarter inches. Now the blade, it's a little bit trickier. It's just under four inches depending on where you measure it from. If you measure to the heel of the edge, it is a four inch blade. But if you're measuring from right here, the peak of the frame to the tip, then it's just a hair under four inches. You have no exposed hardware anywhere on this knife. Nothing visible from the outside holding any of these panels in place. Nothing exposed externally that shows the how the knife is held together on its own. The pocket clip is also blind screwed. There is no exposed pivot. There is no hardware accessible from the exterior of this knife at all. And that's one of the most beautiful things about it. This beautiful, gorgeous, in my opinion, gorgeous design is completely uninterrupted. The flow of the artwork is, isn't bothered by having a bunch of screws holding it together. Now, here's the funny part. If we look deep inside, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a peek in there. You can see a couple of screw heads, right? Because, I mean, how are these pieces being held in? One would assume that there is a hole behind every one of these individual panels. And either there's a threaded post attached to it that go through the knife, or there's just a hole and the hardware goes through the handle into that and fastens it into place. Yeah, no, it, that's not actually how it's done. This thing is being put together like a jigsaw puzzle. Now, I had heard a couple of different ways described to me about how this was done, and I talked to Todd about it a little bit. And listen, I am not mentally anywhere near his level. So even if I were standing in front of him and he were detailing to me how he did this, most of it would probably go over my head anyway, unless he was physically taking all of the pieces apart and I could see it with my own eyes. So basically, take a look at each of these. These are individual pieces of titanium, right? All of them are beveled all around the outer perimeter of each of the individual pieces. And you see they're nicely blued as well. As these pieces are inlaid, it's not just laying that piece on there and then screwing, in, screwing it in from the back. Some of them are done like that. And the way that these individual pieces fit together within this frame, it's almost like being held in by tension. Everything is done together. And here's the thing. You can actually, and, and Todd says on many of his knives, you can take the individual main components apart. So let's say the presentation 
side, the backspacer, the lock side, the pocket clip, the pivot. You could take that apart and the knife still wouldn't be fully disassembled. It wouldn't just fall apart and everything just come out of it. Everything is made individually and he's fitting that individual shape to this section of that frame and he's beveling the sections independently to create this look. And the more you look at it like this, it almost does look more like a work of art, like something Picasso would have drawn. It's, it's just staggering. And even if you or I had the skill to cut these individual pieces and inlay them into the frame and have this perfect spacing between each one in these rant. By the way, these are like these two pieces here are two different sizes. Yet the spacing between them and between the channel uh, where the frame is, is the exact same. Nothing is goofy. Nothing, everything just fits. Even if you or I had the talent to do all that, we probably wouldn't have had the foresight to go and bevel all of the outer edges of each individual component to create this further third dimension, this, this, this 3D look to all of these pieces. I mean, he even took the time to do that on the backspacer, and most people would never notice this because you have to be pretty much zoomed in like I am right here to see that there is a very small micro bevel on the outer edge of that backspacer that has a little bit of blue anodizing as well, just like that faceted edge right there. And then it goes all the way around. And then you see it's blued all the way through on the inside. I mean, all of these little touches that honestly are completely unnecessary. You're already crafting one of the most gorgeous looking knives in the world. And even just having that captive hidden pivot would be enough. But you're hiding all of the hardware. You're inlaying all of these individual pieces. And then you're like, you know what? Let me make this shit just a little bit harder. Let me go and bevel all of these individual edges. And let's keep the bevel consistent, which I'm sure he's doing with a machine. I don't think that he's sitting there and freehand grinding this tiny little piece against his grinder. And he might be because he does have that level of skill. I just don't think that, that would be probably the best use of his time. But he's probably taking even more time by creating a fixture that's going to hold that individual, because again, they're all different size pieces, holding that individual piece at that certain angle and then machining it to create that bevel. However he's doing it, it's extremely difficult to do it. And it goes in with a lot of planning and then a lot of hard work to execute. And all that put together is what creates this knife. And that's what makes it special. That's what makes it a grail. And that's what makes it perfect for my buddy's collection because he has a very specific type of knife maker that he likes to collect. And he will often collect multiples from that maker as long as he's able to find them. And while he did pay considerably more than what Todd would have charged as a direct custom order, which, by the way, his books are closed. You can't just make a custom order. But even though this was considerably more than Todd himself would have charged, probably, my friend feels it's absolutely worth it because now he owns a legend made by a legend where he can have that conversation with somebody and just go, hey, I've got a Todd Rexford and M1B. And the person he's talking to goes, wow. All he has to hear is Todd Rexford. And he has a mental image of knife making perfection and a staggering action. And he gets that person's respect just by saying, that's what I own. 
He doesn't physically have to carry it with him and present it to each person that he's talking to about it. So yeah, in a nutshell, you are getting jaw-dropping precision, a level of absolute perfection in all of the finishes, an action that is just amazing, that perfectly tuned detent, everything that you would expect if you were paying a what anybody would consider to be a ridiculous amount of money for anything. You are buying into a certain level of perfection. There's a difference between the guy that buys a staccato P and a guy that buys an Atlas Gunworks pistol. While they're both going to do the same thing and they're both going to do it exceptionally well. And neither one can be looked down upon because they're incredible and they're also both expensive. I mean, spending $2,500 to $3,500 on a staccato is not a drop in the bucket, but it is nowhere near what you could be dropping if you were buying the Atlas, which would be six, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000. Or getting into an Infinity, nine, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. I mean... And there's a reason why each of those are priced the way they are. Now, can you justify spending this kind of money, man? You're the only one that can answer that. And if you hit the lotto, yeah, you could probably feel a lot more freedoms to do that. And I really hate to just sit here and harp on price, but that is one of the most striking things about this acquisition and it's something that people always talk about when they see a Rexford, especially go up for auction like at Blade Show. One of the most talked about things is the price. And it's going to be a sticking point for a lot of people. But I could tell you right now, yes, 28000 bucks is a lot of money for a knife. But you know what? There are knives out there for $50,000. And if you don't believe me, I'm more than happy to provide proof. I'll even pop up a few pictures uh, and, and knife maker names of those out there that have achieved those levels of pricing. And you get what you pay for because you're buying on a different level. Are we ever going to get there individually, you and me? Eh, probably not. But we can always dream. And... For me, yeah, I would love to spend, you know, sixty thousand dollars on a uh, on an Antonio uh, Fogaritsu or a Wolfgang. Think of a, a Wolfgang Luckner for you know thirty five, forty, fifty thousand dollars. It's never likely to happen for me. But sometimes dreaming of the unobtainium is what fuels our passion in any hobby. I'm never going to own a Ferrari. That doesn't mean I can't sit there and admire one and, and, and dream and wish and respect the workmanship that went into it. That's the way I see it. Anyway, this has been a very, very long video. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that you enjoyed seeing this uh, uber rare piece of history. And uh, unfortunately, I have to gently put this back into its zippered pouch and ship it overseas to my friend and pray that the next time I handle one, it's the one that's in my collection. It won't be, because as hardcore as I am in the knives, I still haven't hit the lottery, so stuff like this is just going to be beyond my reach, and I'm okay with that. I'm out of here for now, guys. Thank you so much, as always, for joining me, and I'll see you on the next video.